God, my rock, in the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you've never failed me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength.
your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love For you're higher than the mountains that I face And you're stronger than the power of Constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. One thing remains. For oh, you're higher than the mountains that I face, and you're stronger than the power of. And you're constant in the trial and the change for one thing.
pray with me this morning? God, we just pray your presence here in this place this morning. We pray that you would be the foundation, the rock, the soul of our worship this morning. That we would have the strength to view you as the center, as the one to whom we rely. The one who gives us the strength to raise our eyes up to you. The one who moves us, the one who centers us, the one who calls us into being. God, we just pray that you would be that for us this morning. Speak to us in the ways that we need to hear you. Amen. Grand earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Be it for me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea And through it all It is well. 
this world with me. Hi, I'm Lori, and you're watching The Wave. Today's Globe Offering supports Dr. Lester Dornan, a missionary appointed to the Tansen Hospital in Western Nepal, where he serves as senior physician. Tansen is in partnership between the people of Nepal and a coalition of 20 Christian organizations from around the world who work to provide health care to the region. Your prayer and financial support are appreciated. Water's Edge is pleased to announce the startup of GATE, a weekly lunch prepared for older adults of the Harbor Country community. This ministry begins on Wednesday, May 4th. Healthy, delicious lunches will be available for older adults at a cost of $3.75 a person. Buffet-style choices will include soup, salad, sandwich, and dessert. The comfortable, relaxed setting will provide opportunity for conversation and relationship. Programs ranging from entertainment to educational will also be offered. The programs begin at 11 a.m. with the meal being served from 11.30 till 12 p.m. every Wednesday in the Commons. Contact Lori Boltes with any questions you may have. Do you have an offering that you would like to give? The offering boxes are located at the rear of the Worship Center and are available whenever you are ready. Also, if you would prefer to give online, head over to h2oedge.org giving to use our online giving portal. We would like to wish a special thanks to the hardworking volunteers of Blessings in a Backpack who have contributed to this successful ministry over the last five school years. Volunteers packed and distributed approximately 2,000 backpacks per school year, or almost 10,000 backpacks so far. Filled backpacks help ensure the children of New Buffalo Elementary School that they have enough food for the weekend. This ministry would not be possible without the help and continued support of our volunteers. If you are interested in Blessings in a Backpack, contact Mary Robertson to become involved. So let's recap what you need to know. Support today's Globe Offering for Dr. Lester Dornan. Older adults, be sure to come to this week's meal at the gate. Feel free to give your offering either in the boxes at the rear of the Worship Center or online. And thank you to our volunteers with Blessings in a Backpack for all of your hard work. To find out how you can become more involved here at Water's Edge, check us out at h2oedge.org or on Facebook. And may God take you to the edge. One thing I learned on my trip up to the uh, North Atlantic to Iceland that Cherry and I took last week is I learned that they know how to build things up in the North Atlantic. I mean, they know how to build stuff in such a fashion that it's built to last. Whether it's in Scotland or Iceland along the Greenland coast, parts of Norway, they face some of the stormiest weather you will ever imagine. And so what they do is they build on the rock. They find a nice flat piece of bedrock and they plop the house down there. And then, you know what? The storms come, the wind howls, the rains hit, the waves crash against the rocks, and the rock just laughs it off. I mean, if rocks could laugh, it would laugh it off. They know how to build up there, which is a wonderful thing. But... As I looked at that when I, we were on our trip, I had to ask myself a question. What do you do when you live in an area like this one, where there's no bedrock? Wherever where you look, what you run into is sand. Now, you and I live in a spot like this where we don't face the storms of the North Atlantic. We don't have anything near like that, but we still do have our storms. We do still have challenges. 
with being near the water. Did you see um, a piece in the Herald Palladium uh, about a month ago about uh, the erosion along uh, our coastline here in New Buffalo? The Sunset Shores area, to be specific. I, I didn't get to go to the meeting, but I, I did read about it briefly, and and I saw a little piece in here where one of the residents of Sunset Shores actually said, you know, if we don't do something, we could lose five houses this summer. Is there anybody here who's got a home in Sunset Shores? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure it's not going to happen. But it's the reality of the world in which we live. We live in sand. Now, Jesus... Jesus didn't live in harbor country, but he lived in an area where he could relate to the sand issue. If you've ever visited the Holy Land, then you know the the hard reality that, yeah, there were great sections of where Jesus roamed and where he taught people that were covered with sand dunes. And if you've ever visited the Holy Land, you know that wasn't the only type of geology that was present there. They also had bedrock, good solid rock on which to build. So Jesus had the experience of both these kind of places to build, and he used that for one of the most intriguing teaching illustrations uh, that is recorded for us in the scripture. He talks about bedrock and how to build on it, and he talks about sand and what happens when you build on that. And in Matthew, the seventh chapter, picking up in the 24th verse, he records that for us. Let's, let's take a look at his words. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows is, is like a person who builds their house on solid rock, like those North Atlantic houses. The rain comes in torrents, the floodwaters rise, the wind beats against that house, but it won't, be, but it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't listen and doesn't obey is like the one who builds their house on the sand. When the rain floods, when they come, when the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. See the difference? Those who choose to follow Christ in this world, we're called to build our lives on the bedrock principles that are the teaching and the life of Jesus Christ, i.e., the house of God, the church, is built on those principles, on that bedrock. And we know, I think, I, I mean, in our minds, I think we, we know what those bedrock principles basically are, don't we? Some of them we think of in religious terms. You know, read your Bible, learn what it has to say and teach, get involved in an active spiritual life, pray. Not just at a blessing over a meal, but pray for your friends and neighbors. Pray for the people you love. I mean, I heard earlier today that that Pete and Sue Rahm are celebrating 40 years of marriage today. I pray and bless for that. Oh, sure, go ahead and applaud. I pray and bless for that. So we know what the religious bedrock principles are, but there are some others that we don't typically think of in religious terms. But they're still bedrock principles. Be financially responsible. Don't overdo the debt. Take care, to, take care of yourself, whether it's in a physical or a spiritual or an emotional or psychological sense. Now, to be sure, those things are, in fact, part of the teachings of Jesus. For example, the thing Jesus talked about more than anything else, second only to love, is wealth. 
Isn't that amazing? But we don't think of those things anymore as kind of bedrock principles that are a part of the the foundational teachings of our lives. And that highlights for us the challenge that we face. As we live in a culture that becomes more and more irreligious, people become less and less aware of these bedrock principles of faith. The things that Jesus teaches us as being foundational for a healthy life. Which, well, makes it a challenge to be the church in the world today. Let me give it to you in a, in a simple metaphorical sense. How do you build a house with good set foundations when all you have is sand? How's that house going to withstand the storms of life? What's going to keep it from toppling over when the floodwaters come? And let's face it, we live in a sandy world. Financial stress, debt overload, it is prevalent in our culture. And that's the stuff of sand. Emotional, spiritual, physical, psychological Well-being is challenged by the stresses that we all live under in this culture. That's sand. Biblical illiteracy in our culture has risen dramatically over the last generation. That's sand. Relationships in our culture are under strain like, like we haven't seen in a long, long time, if ever. That's sand. My friends, you and I live in the sand. And what are you going to do when you live there? How can, for example, Water's Edge Church be an effective, faithful church in a culture of sand? I mean, that's, that's really the underlying challenge. And I want to suggest to you a simple metaphor for us to use when we, when we struggle with this. Let's go out, because we live among the sand dunes, and let's look for the things that not only survive, but even thrive in the sand. Oh, we can find some insects that survive and thrive in the sand, but I'm not interested in the metaphor of the insect. We could, uh, we could try and find um, some other animal life, but, you know, it's rare and few and far between. We could look at the dune grass. That certainly thrives and survives in the, grant, in the, in the sand dunes. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's just grass. But there's one other thing that, just like everywhere else on the planet, or almost everywhere else on the planet, it thrives. That's trees. Just drive around the neighborhoods we all live in. We live in these sandy neighborhoods, and yet we have these enormous trees that still survive and thrive here. And you know what the secret is for a tree to thrive in this sandy world? It's got to have good roots. And for a church to survive and thrive in this world, for Water's Edge to be faithful and impactful in this world, it needs to have Good roots, too. Roots that anchor it in the soil. Roots that enable it to reach all the way down to the bedrock. Roots that will hold it in one place so that it, so that it can't be washed away. Have you ever seen a tree along a riverbank or near a stream? A tree standing along a riverbank The soil around it might get washed away, but the strength of the roots still holds enough of the soil in place to keep it upright. Deep, strong roots are what we need in the sandy soils in which we live, whether as individuals or as a church. And so let's talk just for a few minutes this morning because, because our we talks are intended to give us quick information for us to maul on over the week ahead. What, what are some of the things that roots do for us? First, they offer stability. Having good roots 
hold you in place when the storms of life come. I was doing my research in preparation for this talk, and, and as I was doing it, I wanted to know, what was the trick that helped roots hold a tree in place? I just figured the answer to that question would be, well, there's a lot of them, and if you put out enough roots, that'll do the job. And I found out I was wrong. That's not the secret. It's not the number of roots, it's the nature of the root. If you're ever doing some work in your yard, next time you, you, know, you dig up a fresh root, like you're doing some planting or something from a bush or a tree, rub your hand across that root, and you will feel that it has kind of a, almost a furry texture. Little fine hairs cover all of it. And those are the secret to anchoring an enormous tree in the sandy soil. Here's how it works. Those little tiny furs on the edges of the root, they're the first thing to touch, oh, pieces of bedrock that have been lifted up, or heavy stones in the soil, or just places where the, the earth is compacted. And the root bumps up against that, and it just wraps its way around it and continues to grow. It's sort of like you and I in a dark room. What do we do? We, we put our hands out. We are in an unfamiliar room. We don't know where the switch is. So we just sort of grope along through the room until we get to the other side. That's what roots do in the soil. But there is one difference. When you and I grope our way through a room and we get to the other side, we go, thank heavens, that's over, and we're back in the light. But roots grow through that. And as they grow through it and they wrap their around, themselves around these pieces of rock and stuff, it creates anchors for them. And by growing through the hard stuff, when the storms come, roots keep the tree upright. Huh. I wonder when we're in the dark places in our life, do we just kind of grope our way through it? Or do we grow through it and learn something from it? It's growing through it that enables us to keep strong and make our way through. Learning from us helps us better face the next set of storms. And what's true for an individual is also true for churches. Water's Edge is facing a storm of sorts. If you were with us last week, you know, Andrew and Sarah, Andrew announced that they will be moving to Missouri in a few months. And immediately, what happened? The anxiety level among those of us who are ongoing participants up here just went up. And you know how I know this? I talked to you, and I heard that anxiety. But we grow through times of change, and that enables us to be ready for the next phase. Churches, like people, have to have good roots. So one of the roots you have over here at Water's Edge is this thing called your Staff Parish Relations Committee. And that team of people will work to find our next worship leader. They will grow us through this process, and we will make our way through the storm of transition, whatever transitions come. The second thing roots do that I've, I've discovered is that they provide the nutrients we need to continue to grow and get stronger. Now, i got to tell you, that surprised me. Because when I was in, I think, maybe third or fourth grade, I sat in the classroom, and, and our teacher talked to us about how plants grow, and she described this thing called photosynthesis. And she said, you see those green leaves? They have chlorophyll in them. And the chlorophyll takes the sunlight, and it transforms it into energy, and that's what causes trees and plants to grow. I bet you've heard a similar sort of thing, haven't you? Guess what? That creates the energy a plant needs so it can grow. But I never really thought before, where does the plant get the stuff to make more branches, to get more physical leaves, to grow taller? Guess where it comes from? It comes from the roots. Roots supply the resources a tree needs to grow big and strong and to remain healthy. 
which means you've got to have good roots in this world. If you want to have a healthy, vibrant, strong life, those roots have to be strong. And that takes us all the way back to some of the things we mentioned earlier. The simple things that we don't think of as being part of our religious life. Are you, are you taking care of your responsibilities in life? Are you managing your physical health? Are you managing your financial health? Are, are you managing the things that God has given you as tools for use in this world? If we do those seemingly prosaic and simple things well, that's when we're strongest. That's when we grow tallest. That's when we can reach out the furthest. And it's no different with churches. Water's Edge has adopted a new ministry model, and you might have guessed by now, it has something to do with trees. And each of the ministries of our church is being identified with a different part of a tree. And I'll be alluding to that in the weeks ahead. But two of our root ministries are these. A finance team that is committed to making sure we are financially secure as a church and also enabling you to to use the resources God has blessed you with to serve in the world through this vehicle known as Water's Edge Church. And secondly, a team of people called trustees with a very simple purpose. The lights are on because they make sure the building's working. There's air blowing, and we're not getting overheated because they take care of that. you got to do the same thing in your life. you got to pull out the resources you need and make them usable for the rest of the world. And that means you need strong roots. And you got to manage them. And you got to care for them very, very carefully. Because one thing we know, that when you're in loose, sandy soil like this, if the roots hit something bad, it can kill the whole tree. Now, you and I can drive around our neighborhoods, and we'll see the occasional tree that has tumbled down and and collapsed. And we say to ourselves, something must have gone wrong there. I've got to big, beautiful elm, not many elms in this world anymore, behind the parsonage that is, is starting to go. You've got to manage it. You've got to care for the basic roots of your life. Because it doesn't take much to kill them and then kill the tree. About six years ago, I, I, I read a, a story in the news, and I bet you remember it as I tell you about it, there was a tree that was poisoned to death. Down in Alabama, there's that big rivalry between Auburn and the University of Alabama. I mean, it's almost as good as the rivalry between Michigan and Ohio State. Almost, but not quite. And Auburn had this tradition. They had this enormous oak tree on the edge of campus at what was called Toomer's Corner. And this tree had been around forever. Big, beautiful, enormous oak. And whenever they beat Alabama, the people in the town and the students, they would rally around Toomer's Corner and they'd celebrate around that tree. And an Auburn fan would enjoy that moment until 2010. Then an angry, unhealthy Alabama fan, after they lost to them, went to Toomer's Corner and he poured a herbicide into the soil. They tried to save the tree. They tried for three years, but it was too much poison, and the tree died. Here's the reason this story is so amazing. Do you know how much poison he put into the soil? Less than one part per million. It doesn't take much to kill a tree. Not much at all. So whether in your personal life or in our corporate life as a church, do we have strong roots? Are you reaching down to the bedrock principles of Christ? Your spiritual, your financial, your emotional well-being, your religious life. Are you praying? Are you reading the scripture? Grow the roots that will do that work. 
and then the rest of the tree will grow strong. Let's pray. Lord our God, be with Water's Edge and all the people here as we relearn and redefine what it means to be your church in the sandy soils of the 21st century. In an irreligious world, help us redefine how we do faith. And give us a good foundation first, Lord. The equivalent of that bedrock that Jesus talked about. Give us good, deep roots into your presence, into the into the life you'd have for us so that we grow strong and bring forth beautiful leaves and bear a wonderful fruit that makes a difference in our community and makes a difference for people around the world. They hear about, learn about, and participate in the ministries of Jesus Christ. Amen. A child is waiting. A child is waiting. There are children around the world waiting. Children are waiting. I live here with my family, my mom and dad, and all my brothers. I am the only daughter. Our home is built over a very dirty river. And when the storms happen, our home floods with water and garbage. This is a scary place when it gets dark. People get drunk and fight all the time. I do not go outside at night because I don't know what would happen. Even though I live in this place, I have been sponsored for 14 years by Arlie and Nancy. I call them mom and dad. Although we are countries apart, I know they chose me. They tell me, Eunice, we remember you. We love you. You are like our own daughter. Because of my sponsors, I had the opportunity to go to the Compassion Program at the church in my neighborhood. For all these years, my sponsors and my church have helped me to receive better food and medicine. With the help of my sponsors, I will be able to work, to help my own family. When I was nine, my compassion teacher shared Jesus with us, and that's when I accepted Christ. Even though I am poor, He has provided my church. He gave me sponsors who love me. God will never leave us. I want to share everything I have learned with kids who are like me other children who need sponsors because they also experience poverty. I want them to feel the joy of having a sponsor, to get a letter that says, I love you, you are special to me. With the help of our sponsors, we can grow up and finish our studies and learn how to live our faith in Jesus. I want to serve the Lord and I won't stop serving Him because He does not stop loving me and taking care of me and my family. There are children around the world waiting. Waiting for a sponsor like you. Like you. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
a child is waiting for you. Saeed lives in Tanzania, Africa. He was born in 2002, which is one of the reasons I picked him out of the crowd of different pictures that I saw that one day at a concert, um, because he had the same birth year as Cole, one of my grandsons, and I thought it would be kind of fun to kind of, if I say, work with the two of them together. Uh, he is now 14 years old, and what you're seeing here are some of the pictures that I have gotten from him over the years, he, and some of the things that he has purchased through some of the money that I give as a sponsor. Um, he's very proud of his shoes and his clothes and so forth that he gets, uh, and so he wants to be sure and, and send pictures and let me know that it, it matters to me. But he matters to me because he has, um, he would oftentimes, he sends letters to uh, me as a sponsor at least four or five times a year. Or I can, even, actually now I can do it on emails uh, quite often. I send pictures to him and share with him some of the things in my life and also the, some of the things in my grandchildren's lives so that we have something to talk about and that we can share. But most importantly, we share the love of Christ. Uh, and he tells me his Bible verses and what are, what's important to him. Uh, compassion is, a, is one of the best uh, child sponsors and child. They, they work on their three C's, which is Christ-centered, child-focused, and church-based. So they work with all of their churches in the area as well as all of our churches around here in the United States to promote child sponsorship uh, all over the world, here in the United States as well as all around the world. I want to encourage you today, if you are called at all to help uh, a child, the average sponsorship is $38 a month, a, a dollar a day, which shared with your family sometimes is a wonderful way to connect and to put roots down in other children's lives as well as our own um, we have been i have been blessed so much by the sponsorships that i have participated in and i know you will too because um it's a it's a joy to reach out to some of these children who are um who need to hear from you it's not only just a matter of getting, if I say, help to them in terms of spiritual life, which they get a, a lot of, but it also gives them an education. And, uh, they, they get more of an education through compassion, and they also get good health care through, through compassion. It gives the whole community that they're working with. Um, Saeed happens to be in a community which is HIV very high, the average income there is about $6.40 a month. And he lives with his grandparents, um, not his parents. I think they are gone. Uh, and he works around in their home and so forth to earn himself a little bit of money. But it's very slim uh, in their area. So I know that our help is a great help to him as well. So if you're called at all to... Think about a sponsorship if you would like to see. I have out in the commons, I'll have a little table out there. I have some pictures of some children who are looking for a sponsor, but I also have slips that if you would like to just take a slip home and pick out uh, a child of your own in your own area or whatever you, whatever age child you might be interested in or whatever gender child you would be interested in, that's fine too and you can bring that information back to me so um, see me at the table if you're interested at all um, I think it will be a blessing to you as it has been to me 
if you will pray with me. Father, our, our roots that we've been talking about are not only right where we live, but they're all over. Those little hairs that Pastor Brad was talking about that are attached to those roots go far. Sometimes we can't be there physically, but we can help. And this is one way that we can help other children around the world reach and hear about our beautiful Christ and what he does to the lives of those that he becomes involved in. So we thank you. We ask that you put in the hearts of those who might be concerned about other children to help sponsor and to reach out to these children so that they too may put roots down in their, in their communities and become the strong foundation that God calls us to be. And now if you will join with me in the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is well.
a strong foundation in your God and walk with Christ. Dive deeper into your faith and may God take you to the edge this week. Amen.